Hello, my name is Dr. Darshan Arvais, and I'm here with Mary Tarsha, and we're happy to be speaking for the audience of the Center for Global Non-Killing. We're going to present some of our research, our findings, uh, which are interdisciplinary and also developmentally oriented, and we are excited to do this and hope that you will have an open mind to see the big picture that we are encountering and trying to describe. Hi, Mary. Hi, Georgia. So our title is The Evolved Nest, Wellness-Informed Development and Thriving. And we're both at the University of Notre Dame and the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. We'd like to encourage you to watch the film that's six minutes long that actually gives the big picture in very brief amount of time. We're going to do some of that, but please do watch this film. Go to www.breakingthecyclefilm.org. First of all, we wanna point out that the setting that we're in today is quite a big mess. We have been uh, undermining human well-being in the United States in particular, which is important to know because the United States exports its ways of being to the rest of the planet. And we have uh, terrible uh, illnesses of all kinds and violence and shrinking lifespans and ill-being uh, for all ages, essentially, uh, typically at the bottom of any rankings internationally. At the same time, human beings across the planet, and not every human being, but the dominant culture, is, are destroying the habitat, the planet, uh, ecosystems all over the world in multiple ways. Earth systems are breaking down, we have climate instability, massive ecological disruption from human activity everywhere, with wildlife disappearing, uh, massive poisoning of soil, air, water, and our bodies, and the oceans filling with plastic rather than animal life. What has gone wrong? So what do sustainable societies have to teach us about wellness and peace? And so this is a way that we can remember our wellness informed pathway and learn from other societies that can help us understand in more depth how to be well and how to promote peace and nonviolence. So this is an alternative pathway to the one that we were just describing the results of the illness and ill being and destruction that the dominant culture has been promoting uh, intentionally or not. That's really a trauma inducing pathway. So now we're gonna talk about a wellness inducing, a well being inducing, or what we're calling here, wellness-informed pathway. So the connection between wellness and peace have been related for some time with um, thinkers such as Galtung and Bolding, the fathers of peace studies or peace research, understanding the importance of both investigating negative and positive aspects of peace. So negative peace generally refers to the absence of personal and structural violence, whereas positive peace refers to the promotion of social wellness or social justice. But we know that there cannot be one without the other, and also that they are intimately linked such that the absence of negative peace doesn't necessarily mean that there is positive peace or wellness. And so there's been a shift to understand that we need much more than just simply the elimination of violence or the elimination of disease, but we need to support wellness. So this is what we're talking about in terms of a wellness informed positive piece, which is focusing on how we can meet the basic needs of individuals. And in that way, support and help uh, communities and individuals thrive. Where do we find the pathway to wellness and peace? Well, it's in our human history. 
95% of our history as uh, Homo sapiens has been spent in Earth-centric societies that are focused on meeting basic needs. These are represented by small band hunter-gatherer societies uh, all over the world, independently uh, with similar characteristics. They're foragers with few possessions. They're immediate return societies versus not delayed return societies, those who cultivate plants, domesticate animals, and accumulate resources. And these are still worldwide, although under duress in this era of predatory capitalization, uh, globalization. Uh, the First Nation communities around the world, though traditionally uh, exhibit the same kinds of characteristics. And they have traditions of providing what we're gonna talk about as the evolved nest throughout life. And each of them have unique interrelations with the natural world, with their particular landscape where they exist. Uh, and they're characteristically generous, calm, kind, and cooperative. And we'll say more about that in a moment. Our wellness informed pathway then has four components that we'll mention. It meets humanity's basic needs, fosters thriving in individuals and communities, develops heart-mindedness, the center of being in the heart, in the feelings for, feelings with, rather than in the head, in the intellect. And it supports earth-centered living know-how for getting along with nature instead of living against nature. First then, what are our basic needs as human beings? Well, we are animals, and so we need nourishment warmth, protection, and safety. But we're also mammals, and mammals need lots of affection, play, and inclusion in the family and community. We're also social mammals, and they need extensive bonding with multiple adults, multiple others, and community support, as well as social enjoyment of being with others of the same species or other species. But we also are humans with particular needs for our own thriving. And these include for children an intersubjectivity with multiple adults, so they learn flexible attunement to different kinds of people and relationships. Also needing all of us throughout life an immersion in communal life, supportive communal life. Children need apprenticeship and adult activities, modeling and practice. Uh, observation and full participation. They need to make meaning. Humans need to make meaning out of their lives. And this is then encouraged by the stories that are told in the community and by how the child is treated. And then finally, we need to expand ourselves beyond our own egos to feel connected to more than ourselves. And we need healing practices because we make mistakes and we lose connection. And those things need to be healed in order for us to uh, fully um, exhibit our potential. We can see embodied wellness if we think of the chakras and how they are related to um, full ex exhibition of the true self. Uh, and so when these are well balanced, a person will have self security, a joyful creativity, self confidence, unconditional love that's emitted towards others, expressive sharing, spiritual intuition, and a trust in oneness. So these are uh, embodied ways of being, uh, embodied ways of wellness that we can uh, describe from multiple perspectives. So this is more of an Eastern perspective. In terms of the growth of the self, uh, initially a child builds a core self and when well supported through what we're gonna call the evolved nest is going to build a sense of trust, of feeling safe with others on the planet, in nature, and feeling confident that they are able to successfully move through the world and through the social world and through the natural world. 
And as they grow, they develop more empathy, more social skills, more sociality, the acting self. And finally, when they are fully um, mature, at, after three decades, usually around age 30, they'll have a more holistic, integrated sense of self that we call communal. Second, then, what does human thriving really look like? These lists here are from are gathered from small band hunter gatherers from around the world. And what anthropologists and, and others have noted are characteristics, what you can observe among the adults, in particular in these societies. A thriving individual has a quiet mind, inner happiness with a childlike glee that bursts out at uh, various moments, a sense of vitality and being fully alive, fully autonomous, uh, making their own choices. They're honest and have a sense of humor. They have outstanding memory and senses. They build habits at will. They have great know-how for getting along in the particular landscape. They feel ecologically attached, attached to the natural world and have a relational respect for it. And then have a deep uh, sense of connection to spirit has an, that means you have an awareness of reality beyond what you can see or touch. And then in relationship, what does that look like? A thriving uh, a person who's thriving in relationship enjoys being with others and enhances their being. They're relationally attuned, responsive to the other. They give and receive empathy, listen unconditionally. They're communally oriented to the well-being of the uh, band or group, uh, and including the other than human. They're authentically helpful. They display unconditional love and forgiveness. They're generous. They practice generosity. They expect generosity. They're egalitarian. No one co coerces anyone else. They have respect for ancestors uh, and also future generations. So there's a sense of embeddedness in a web of life that crosses time and space, and they feel responsibility then towards this web of life. What happens in our ancestral context, the small band hunter gather context, the nomadic foraging context, those who provide the evolved nest, which we'll describe shortly, is the heart sense. The magnetic field of the heart is grown in the species typical way of connection. And this is the heart-mindedness that all societies, virtually all of them have emphasized as central to being a human being. And we uh, develop this or we encourage it when we uh, hug others, when we carry babies, and uh, this resonance that we receive from others actually builds our health, keeps us healthy, keeps us tuned in to the living world and the living connections that we have with everyone. Heart-centeredness then results in two kinds of ethical mindsets we've identified. These are peaceful, peaceable mindsets, the relational engagement, which is the ability to be flexibly attuned to the other in the moment, to be fully present here and now with a intersubjectivity, the shared space of communication, of uh, thoughts and feelings resonating with the other with an egalitarian regard, not wanting to be superior or dominant or withdrawn, but instead treating the other with reverence in an I-thou relationship. We have a small ego then, and we're more oriented to enhancing the other. And these, uh, this, uh, Orientation or mindset is developed then by support of caring relationships and communities that uh, provide for basic needs. And we can see it uh, resulting in secure attachment through companionship care, which we'll talk about as the evolved nest. Then there's communal imagination. This is the ability to use our abstract thinking, our ability to think outside the present moment to um, imagine possibilities, and this kind of imagination that grows out of that relational engagement, the ability to be present, empathic, fully um, feeling connected to the other, 
and we display then in our imaginations, our constructions of uh, ideals, an egalitarian respect, a resonant responsibility for others in the web of life, a sympathetic action, and a sense of personal agency that flows together with our sense of communion and connection to others. Both of these are co-constructed with through experience with caregivers after birth. So thriving societies then spend most of their time in what we call the positive social engagement, the face-to-face uh, -face enjoyment of one another through music and dance and song and laughter, even work is enjoyably uh, social. There's no coercion. And the higher consciousness then emerges from this positive social engagement. Uh, our imaginations are emotionally engaged, not detached, not vicious, uh, but they're as part of um, a holistic orientation to living life. And then that uh, little bubble there on the left, the social self-protection of uh, feeling um, worried about how others are gonna treat us is very minimally experienced, not very much. And so these societies are characterized by egalitarianism, a sense of connection to a sacred web of life. Everything is alive. Everything is sentient. I'm part of this whole, I'm not superior to it. I'm not inferior to it. I'm just part of it. Uh, and an orientation to harmony and balance with high autonomy though, still the individual has a lot of, um, is not coerced by anyone and follows their own impulses, which are well developed in these societies because they've been so well nourished, their basic needs are met. So they have a high autonomy that actually fits with a high communalism. And then finally, this earth-centered living know-how means that the orientation to living on the earth follows what Aldo Leopold uh, said, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. And so in these communities, there's a sense of that, that you wouldn't cut down a rainforest tree because then it's gone. Uh, why would you do that? Uh, all sorts of creatures depend on that one tree. Why would you ever think of cut, cutting it down? Uh, this is what, uh, what wise elders have <laughs> remarked uh, when they've been questioned about that. And so the earth-centered living know-how is uh, conveyed by the wise elders of the community. It comes, uh, they are the ones who know, have synthesized all this, have lived it, and are the ones that we need to listen to, to um, support this aspect of wellness. So the cycle of development that we're going to talk about is from uh, this early life experience, number one there, how the individual's early life experience leads to number two, a, how well or ill functioning their psychosocial neurobiology becomes based on their experience. And then the kind of adults they become based on those early experiences. And then those adults build a culture that matches up with their own experiences, how they've been treated and the stories they've been told and the capacities they have as a result of their developmental uh, pathway. So cycle of development then moves from individual to culture and then culture back to individuals and it's ongoing. The path to wellness then is our heritage. This is what we see in these small band hunter gatherers in traditional First Nation communities, a cycle of cooperative companionship. And this means that one, there's companionship care from conception. And we'll tell you what that looks like in a moment. It leads to a healthy psycho, psychology, sociology, neurobiology, which leads to adults, number three, who have well being and wisdom. They grow and flourish. And then it leads to four, a community that attends to basic needs, continues to attend to basic needs, and the cycle continues across generations. And that community that's tending to the basic needs is that community that is thriving, 
as we were talking about. So that's right. what it looks like. And so, you know, that is a peaceful society. That's a thriving society. And it's a society that's me meeting the basic needs of individuals and communities and families. Yes. So what does that look like? So uh, companionship care, as we were talking about, that forms the foundation of physical and psychological health, which then feeds into healthy sociality and morality, and then ultimately a healthy society, begins with satiating the needs of children and families. And that takes place through humanity's evolved developmental niche or the evolved nest. And the evolved nest is just one of many inheritances that we have from um, our uh, previous ancestors and from our culture. But broadly, and we'll go through each of the components of the evolved nest addressing that specific question of how can we meet the needs of children and families uh, through the evolved nest, but it is a set of social and ecological circumstances that surround uh, individuals and surround families. And most of these practices are over 75 million years old. And so in this way, we can see that evolution has really done the experiments, right? And showing us what we need to thrive and what um, satiates us best, both physically, uh, neurobiologically, as well as psychologically. And in the beginning of life for, for infants, they are very immature. And so they resemble fetuses till about 18 months of life because there is so much growth and development that is taking place within the first 18 months and as well as the first three years. So it's very important to meet their needs quickly and effectively in order to support their neurobiological and psychological development. And so as I was talking about how the brain develops very quickly within the first few months of life, actually 80 to 90% of brain growth happens within the first three years of life. And the way that the brain develops is dependent upon experience. And so there is this continual interaction between nature and nurture. So they are not separate but it's the genetic component as well as the epigenetic component, meaning that experience influences which genes are turned on or turned off. And in this way, there is this dynamic interaction taking place. And so we say that there's a biosocial construction that's taking place within the individual, within that small infant. And so emotions and cognitions then are intertwined and developing together. And caregivers are co-constructing this, which then lays the foundation for the implicit self and then eventually the social worldview. So human babies really need in the first months of life, a womb with a view or exterogestation, those calming, soothing, responsive and nurturing experience from their caregivers. Yes. And we, we are biosocial creatures. That means our biology is shaped by our, our social experience. And then our sociality, our social capacities are shaped by our biology. So it's an interaction always. And those first five years in particular are extremely important for shaping who we become. So to begin with, we asked the question, you know, how can we support the neurobiology of the developing person, which then will give way to their sociality and their morality? And so to begin with, the first component of the nest is providing soothing perinatal experiences, uh, prenatal and perinatal ex experiences, excuse me. So experiences when the infant is in the womb and also during birth and after birth. So a wellness approach to understanding the needs of the developing person begins with a calm and welcoming environment during gestation, birth, and afterwards 
And this follows the natural rhythms of the mother and the child. And so there is a sensitivity to the signals of the developing child in the womb. But we know, unfortunately, that many practices in the United States can often stress the baby and disrupt development and bonding. And in this way, unfortunately, promote trauma. And so specific examples of this include coerced births, uh, labor restrictions of the mother, different types of drugs that can impair the baby for many weeks, medical routines and environmental stressors, such as smells and bright lights, rough treatments, and the separation of the mother and baby. And in this way, mother-infant entrainment is affected physiologically and psychologically. And let me just mention circumcision. Infant circumcision is particularly harmful uh, and is practiced widely still in the United States. And Darsha, would you like to tell us about this within the first few months of life? It's really a world of feelings. That's right. Dan Stern, the psychotherapist, emphasized how children in these first months of life are just a weather system. <laughs> their feelings in motion, they're just shifting among uh, different waves of feeling, of hunger, of distress, uh, and the ebbing of pleasure. Uh, they have shifting states of consciousness. They're sleepy, they're drowsy, they're uh, alert, they're irritable. Uh, and what he talks about is the importance then of paying attention to try to uh, restore the calmness. So, for example, when hunger occurs, uh, the baby is just uh, will become overwhelmed by that feeling unless it's uh, nipped in the bud, unless it's uh, taken care of soon. It will just overwhelm them like a hurricane of feeling. Everything is affected movements, breathing, attention, arousal, perceptions, and so on. And so, you don't want babies to stay in a hurricane a system of feeling for very long or ever, really. It's better to move in before the storm comes and to settle them down with whatever it is they need. Otherwise, their, their brain is learning that uh, kind of um, spectrum of, of arousal that you let them practice. So if you let your baby practice lots of screaming, uh, they will then have that set as thresholds, as normal uh, personality behavior over time. Instead, you want to keep them in a calm state. Uh, and that means the mother's presence really matters because the mother especially is good uh, for calming the baby. The baby spent at least nine months in the mom's womb, uh, knowing her smell and her, her movements, her voice. And so uh, you're going to say more, I think, about that. And uh, you don't want the baby to get overwhelmed by this hurricane and become disorganized because it takes so long to get back to feeling settled. So it's better just to pay attention to those little gestures and the grimace on the face and move in to comfort that baby before things get out of hand. Well, next, the next component of the evolved nest is breastfeeding. So breastfeeding is so important for building a healthy brain, especially a brain that is rapidly developing. And so we know that there are uh, studies and comparison studies between breastfed infants and formula fed infants. We see that breastfed infants have higher IQs and executive functioning skills that persist into adulthood. And breast milk is an analgesic such that it reduces pain and helps soothe the infant uh, in many ways, including the properties of the milk itself functioning as an analgesic. The oligosaccharides within breast milk or the sh sugars have an incredible antimicrobial and protective biofilm component. And there are many um, investigations also looking at the lipids that are also tremendously benef beneficial for the development of the immune system. In the comparison studies, we also see that infants who are breastfed have a larger brain size. 
such that they have greater myelinization of the white matter. And observational studies show us that breastfed infants have greater cognitive and behavioral development. And so breast milk itself is um, so fundamental to building a healthy brain. And we also know that breastfeeding empowers the child. So the actual mechanics of breastfeeding versus uh, bottle feeding are very, very different, such that when breastfeeding, the baby controls the size of each mouthful and regulates how much he or she is eating. And the baby stops when he or she is full. And breast milk also changes. So breast milk itself is unique for each baby, such that the mother's milk changes depending upon the needs of the child. Um, and it changes over time, such that if there's a growth spurt, there will be different components, uh, different lipids within the breast milk in order to support that development of the infant at that particular moment. And breast milk also changes throughout the day, such that at night, there are different hormones within breast milk to promote sleep versus in the morning, uh, there is more uh, hormones that are to energize and activate the infant. And breast milk also is different for boys and for girls, which is quite an interesting new finding. So how long uh, do mothers breastfeed? Here's a chart that shows you what primates, uh, how long they breastfeed on average. So you can see on the left, uh, the years of breastfeeding there. So six years on average, primates are breastfeeding their young. Our, our ape um, cousins on average uh, are gonna be weaning between four and six years. In our ancestral context, those are nomadic foragers. We can see that there's a large range. If you look at that arrow from two and a half to eight years has been observed. But the four year mark is the average age of weaning. Now you wonder why, oh my gosh, the brains explode with, with that information in the Western world. Uh, why would that be? It's because the immune system is being constructed by breast milk itself. It has all the building blocks for the immune system, which is largely in the gut. And so at least four years is, is uh, important for building a healthy uh, functioning immune system. And then notice the pink column there, the peaceful societies around the world. Uh, this study was done by James Prescott. He studied what were the characteristics of peaceful societies around the world and found that uh, they breastfed for at least two and a half years. They carried their children around most of the time, their young children. And that explained 80% of the variance. And then if he added in that they, there were no sanctions of premarital sex in the society, uh, there, that explained 100% of the variance. So that is an indicator of what seems to be important to develop a peaceful individual and a peaceful community. <laughs> and then the other two uh, columns there, WHO, the World Health Organization, recommends at least two years of breastfeeding. And in the United States, that last column, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends 12 months of breastfeeding. So the next component is positive moving touch with no negative touch. And so when we look at communities, like Tarsha is saying, that are peaceable and sustainable, we see that they are infants and children are being constantly held and touched within the first years of life so that they are kept in continual bodily contact with mothers and mother's friends and others on the lap or seated and that infants are not put down and they have the priority uh, within the community. So they're not seen as um, you know, a liability sometimes that is viewed within uh, the dominant culture, but that is seen as interactive and part of the community, such they are part and extension of the mother and the other caregivers in constant uh, physical contact. And there is no negative touch or 
forms of corporal punishment. And so we know that physical touch and affection grow and synthesize DNA such that it promotes healthy, healthy sleep cycles, adaptive behavioral arousals, exploratory activities, and both social and cognitive functioning, in addition to being calming. And it has long lasting health benefits by preventing excessive stress and hippocampal dysfunction and even eventual depression. So a recent meta-analysis by this group at the, at the bottom found that negative touch has very impactful long-term negative effects. And they concluded that spanking, which is a form of negative touch, is empirically similar to physical and emotional abuse when looking at outcomes within children. The next nest component is positive social climate. And what this means is that uh, babies are welcomed uh, by the community and they're desired and um, there is an attention to tactile stimulation um, daily from the infants. And so this surrounds the infant that their needs are seen as important and are met with a sense of welcome. And generally what we mean by positive social climate is that there are more positive rather than negative emotions present within the household or in the community. So there is a greater sense of joy and serenity and expansiveness and less sadness, anger, fear, or humiliation. It's also interesting that adults who report more positive emotions in their childhood are more secure, mentally healthier, less distressed, and less likely to have a self-protective morality. So that the child grows up feeling loved and cherished, and this helps the infant and the developing child develop positive interactions and reactions in others, and also supports their ability to develop deep friendships later on. The fifth component is self-directed social play with multi-age playmates. And so what we mean by this with social play is that interaction with others that is free, it's not directed or organized by adults, uh, although those can have some benefits as well, but they're free to interact and play with other children uh, of different ages. And this facilitates emotion regulation, including calming aggressive urges. It also influences gene expression and fosters brain development in general, particularly the right hemisphere, which we'll talk about uh, more. In the last decades in the United States, due to parent anxiety and the use of screens and the emphasis on achievement, there have been many fewer opportunities for children to play in a self-directed manner. So this is why it's so important to talk about play and to help uh, children have those opportunities to play. The sixth uh, nest component is allo mothers or other nurturers. So, you know, it really takes a community to raise a child well, and mothers need support to care for their children. So mothers who actually receive social support or perceive social support, this is correlated positively with children's social skills and negatively with behavior problems. And so, you know, children do best in societies where childbearing is considered too important to be in left entirely to parents. And allo parents are really a protective factor because they both promote positive things as well as decrease negative. And so by having other nurturers around both the child and the parent, there's also an increase in knowledge that's communicated to the parents to help understand how to raise that child well. Darsha, can you tell us about the seventh component, which is responsive relationships? Yes, responsive relationships refers to 
a kind of relationship where you have reciprocal communication, where there's synchrony between the mother and child, the caregiver and the child. And then when there's dyssynchrony, where they miscommunicate, it's repaired. Uh, and the child learns then to repair uh, relational communication from experiencing the repairing by the mother. In these kinds of relationships, there's a mutual influence. The mother is, allows herself to be influenced by the child's communications and not just uh, follows her rigid script of what things should be like and how the child should behave. And together they build shared narratives, shared little um, rituals perhaps in, when before the child can talk, you know, of, of playing various games together just momentarily. And over time, then these grow into longer conversations uh, when the child learns to speak. So a responsive relationship means meeting the child's needs in the moment to understand that the child wants to be connected and that when there's uh, misbehavior or the child gets upset and is uncontrolled in some fashion, they're feeling disconnected somehow, that the mother or caregiver who is attuned to the needs of the child is going to be responsive to whatever that need is and help the child settle again, help them express their needs and help them get them met. And all of this establishes brain wiring that's healthy, emotion regulation that's healthy, and trajectory for healthy habitual patterns. Alan Shore writes about the importance of early life experience for brain development extensively. And in this quote, he talks about secure attachment, which is a signal that the brain development is going well, that the social capacities are being developed well in a, a responsive relationship. And the way it looks, to an outsider is uh, a psychobiological attunement, not with the infant's cognition or their behavior, but with their dynamic alterations of autonomic arousal. So how their body is feeling and what they're expressing in their body. And the parent then will recognize when the child is getting a little bit too excited uh, and help them calm down, or if they're too unexcited too, uh, lethargic help them get back to kind of an optimal arousal state. And this is something the mother, uh, a well-tuned mother will do automatically. Uh, and it's something that a caregiver who's responsive will do. And so this results in the infant's negative states being minimized because the adult is helping <clears throat> the child get back to an optimal state. And it also maximizes the positive affective states through interactive play. So play is a functionally a health enhancing experience for everyone who participates in this self-directed social play throughout life. Uh, and it starts building a brain well in the early years of experiencing play. And Dersha, you know, as we've talked about at the beginning a little bit, you know, the ethnographic research shows that these sustainable communities spend the majority of their time in play, right? So that they're continually uh, joking and interacting in a way that is part of this dynamic interaction that helps calm them down, but also promotes the open heartedness and the calming. And so this uh, responsiveness and play are really linked and are important across the lifespan. That's right. And play only occurs if you feel at ease, if you mm -hmm. feel well, and if you feel safe. And when you don't feel safe and don't feel well, kids, children, mammals do not play. And so you can see in these societies that they're, they feel relaxed. They feel at ease on the earth. At, with one another, and so they can play. And unfortunately, in our current, in the United States, in our current uh, system, most people do not feel at ease. They're under stress a lot, and so it makes it more difficult to play. Mm -hmm. 
And again, uh, just to emphasize the importance of maintaining baby's optimal arousal. Uh, this is a diagram to dem demonstrate that. So over arousing, if the baby gets over aroused, it means they're discomforted and it may move into extreme panic, fear, or anger. You don't want them to practice that because then that can become part of their personality. And, and you don't want them to be under aroused, which is where they're not uh, regulating their heart rate or breathing or digestion, often because they're not on the body of a caregiver. That's not good either because they can actually die from that or um, <clears throat> they can just not grow well. And you wanna be in that sweet spot in the middle, the optimal arousal for healthy growth. Darcia, can you tell us about the eighth component, which is nature connection, which is so important for well-being? Nature connection is part of our heritage as well. This means that you feel highly integrated with the rest of the natural world. You fit into the ecology around you and to feel at home on the earth. You feel placeful. This is, uh, I'm part of this land. I'm part of this landscape. And when you have those feelings, you are gonna treat the natural world, the animals and plants around whom you live, you're gonna treat them with respect as part of your web of relations. And that's what we see in these earth-centric societies, foragers and others. And then we have number nine, the last of the components, routine healing ceremonies. These are things that occur in, in the group to promote respect for nature, to build the community bonds, to heal relationships, even to uh, heal individuals. This is something in the San Bushman, for example, of uh, Southern Africa. They have been around for at least 150,000 years. We actually have received our genes through them all over the world. Our genes are, uh, have been matched up or um, emerging from their society. And they have uh, the healing ceremonies uh, several times a week. They have grief ceremonies several times a week. Because if we don't have routine healing, we can actually then carry around hurts and uh, grudges and resentments or uh, just illnesses and they, they become kind of a burden on our backs, a backpack of of burdens and we need to have routine uh, healing individually as a group in order for us to be able to be present in the ways that we described earlier to be to thrive as individuals and to thrive in relationship so these are the components of the evolved nest again what every child what every adult needs to thrive and reach their potential all of them are needed by children, and then most of them by everyone throughout life. <coughs> so healthy development begins with and is sustained by the evolved nest. You can see these are the components we all need now. But what happens when you move from societies that whose early childhoods look more like this? to early childhoods that look more like this. Lots of isolation, not much touch, not much togetherness, less responsiveness, less being known, heard. More isolation. Mm -hmm. Well, how do we get there? Um, culture has trumped our biology and our evolution. Ian Sati, psychotherapist, talked about in the United States that there's a taboo on tenderness. And Dan Stern picks up from there and he says, although the overriding need of an infinite child for love and security is now well known, there are some who protest against it. And these are the protests. Why should an infant make such demands? Why can't he be satisfied with less care and attention? How can we arrange things so that parents have an easier time? And he warned, in the meanwhile, we should be wise to respect his needs, his or her needs, and to realize that to deny them is often to generate in the child powerful, 
forces of libidinal, which means affectionate attachment, demand, and propensity to hatred, which can later cause great difficulties for both him and us. And so what's happened in the United States is we have lots of voices saying, oh, children are resilient. Ah, oh, they'll be fine. Parents, just pay attention to what you need. And that's been around for at least 100 years, perhaps 150 years of advice that trumps our biology and evolution. So that leads to the question of what happens with unnestedness or when children and infants and families' needs are not met. We know that this can potentially lead to dysregulation and seeds of ill health, both mental uh, pathology, physical, social, and moral, and can lead to a disconnection from a sense of self to others, the community, and even the world around them. So to sparse, to, uh, sparse them apart and talk about them separately because it's so important, there are physical and psychological differences, but what happens physiologically when infants' needs are ignored, we know that there is an activation of the stress response can be a dysregulation of the immune system in addition to the endocrine system, that's the hormone system. Neurotransmitters can be altered, both their number and function, and emotions and emotional systems can be undermined. And the corpus callosum itself, which is what connects both the left and right hemispheres, can be disrupted. And there can even be gaps or lesions in brain systems from early trauma, abuse, neglect, or undercare. And so all of this could be summarized as early life stress, which is undermining development uh, globally. And we call undercare what results from the lack of the evolved nest. And then there are also the outcomes psychologically. So physiologically, there are alterations, and this leads to psychological alterations when early needs are ignored. So there's a sense of a distrust of your own body and an impaired sense of self. This can result in a sense of living against instead of with others and can develop a social disagreeableness, such as uh, being oppositional or withdrawn, and even the distrust of others leading to anxiety, cynicism, and demonization of others. In the Hawaiian view, each child is a bowl of light, but each hurt, each uh, lack of meeting the basic needs is going to accumulate uh, as psychic wounds. And they accumulate like stones to block the individual's spirit. And this is what happens then when the evolved nest is not provided or there's other kinds of trauma. Uh, the, the individual then is carrying around this weight and they cannot, their spirit cannot be expressed because they have so much in, in effect, garbage that has been put upon them that needs to be cleared in order for the true self to flourish. And so we can get stuck in our survival systems <clears throat> instead of feeling secure and feeling connected and feeling confident, we can end up with insecurity, numbness, and self-doubt. And these can be planted then in those first years of life before we have words, before our language develops. And so we have an internal sense of these feelings that are kind of hovering over us, like the primal woundedness of the light being dimmed. Protectionist mindsets then occur from this kind of undercare. These are face-to-face -face orientations where the person is unable to feel the egalitarian uh, relation, is unable to be flexibly attuned to the other in the moment. 
and instead has to go into more primitive systems, our primate systems of uh, being one up and being oppositional and uh, the sympathetic system of the autonomic system in the body is activated and you're feeling aggressive, right? Or defensive and uh, easily threatened. And so you uh, bullies then are going to uh, uh, push out and, and blame others. They're gonna externalize. That means blame others for when they feel bad. It's your fault, you did it. Uh, or, depending on what happened in early life, the timing and the intensity and duration of when the undercare occurred, you might then have instead a more social withdrawal orientation where you, you just disappear, you become a wallflower in the moment, you don't speak up, you're not, you don't speak your truth, you're passive and compliant and you internalize instead and blame yourself for anything that goes wrong. Or you might flip between these two, the fight or flight. And then there's emotional dissociation, which is common among uh, sexually abused children, where you go into an emotional shutdown. Uh, you go into freeze, freezing and numbness, and you escape. You try not to, because it was uh, maybe inexpressible as a young child, uh, when you were traumatized, you disappear and you escape then into being heartless or addicted. Uh, and each of these uh, characteristics or mindsets are occur because the stress response system and other systems have been shaped into uh, distress uh, reaction. Uh, the systems that we are born with, these are good things to have, the fight, flight, freeze, faint for acute uh, stressors, like if I, um, hurricane comes, you need to run away from it and find shelter. But in these undercare situations, which are too very widespread now in the United States, you learn to stay in these modes chronically, that you are always feeling threatened. <clears throat> so you can never um, be yourself, essentially. And we'll say more in a moment. So putting it all together, this is a really great slide that helps us understand both the psychology and the neurobiology of what's happening in each social situation and how this influences our social and moral orientation that Darsha was just talking about. So we can think about in each social situation, there is a neuroception taking place where this is the unconscious sense of a situation is being safe or unsafe. And we've referred to this as this bottom up shifting because it's taking place unconsciously with this very embodied sense of experience. And if we sense that it is a safe social situation, this can lead to a sense of engagement and attunement so that we have a social approach orientation, a sense of reward and social reading and even meaning making. And it's a general openness to life. However, the opposite can happen if there is a sense of it being unsafe so that our safety defenses become mobilized. So this is the fight, flight, freeze, or faint responses that ultimately result in a sense of bracing against life. And then of course, there is conceptual framing or this top-down thinking that we refer to what we read the stories we hold, the narratives that we believe uh, that then influence how we think about each social situation. And depending upon the experiences within our childhood, we can then shift between the engagement or the safety uh, in one way or the other and in a different type of frequency. So depending upon how much of the nest that we received, this is going to shift us into a more frequent engagement and open to life orientation. However, depriving needs, basic needs of children and uh, being unnested can then lead us to a sense of feeling defensive and bracing against life majority of the time. And so, you know, as Darcy was saying, these safety defenses are very important for us to know when something is truly not safe. 
but with unnestedness, your sense of unsafety increases such that you're feeling unsafe more often than not. What's happened then in the United States is that we've entered a cycle of competitive detachment where number one, there's undercare, so developmentally inappropriate child raising, leading to dysregulated psychosocial neurobiologies in the children, which leads to adults who are exhibit ill-being and they have limited socio-moral capacities, like we were just saying, they're more threatened all the time. And so they're gonna be more oppositional or withdrawn, apathetic, rather than relationally attuned and engaged and connected. And then they are creating, they support a trauma-inducing culture. And in this culture, then the adults are distracted, uh, overwhelmed, they're neglectful, or they're over-controlling. So they're cacostatic. They, they don't uh, meet uh, in the middle there and have the attuned, uh, optimal sweet spot of responsiveness to others. Instead, they're overdoing it or underdoing it and flipping between those states all the time. And we can call this whole cycle then a uh, one of extreme social poverty. There might be lots of wealth around, at least in, among some people in some communities, but everyone is suffering from social poverty. And the result in this society then, this competitive detachment society is that you spend a lot of time in social self-protection ethics. You are then, as we have said, feeling threatened most of the time. You can't relax and enjoy life so much as just grim and bear it, get through it somehow uh, with the uh, whatever resources you have in the moment. And this uh, fosters then various superstitions about things because you start to feel more paranoid uh, because those uh, early life experiences made you feel unsafe and you want to explain it. <clears throat> and you develop then instead vicious imaginations, which means that you want to control other people or you want to take revenge and your mind is oriented that way because you're upset and you again externalize, you blame others for your feelings because you don't want to look at your own self and heal yourself because it's not encouraged or because it's not safe to do so. And your imagination is, is kind of oriented to viciousness or to detachment, to just not feel anything and just be in your head and have abstractions guide you and ideologies uh, that aren't grounded in experience. And you spend very little time in what we call the engagement ethic, that social relational attunement in the moment to others. And there's not very much communal imagination that goes with that engagement ethic, the abstracting with the web of life in mind. And so the resulting everyday life is that you, you're in a hierarchical situation, your status is important, dominance is important, you're alienated from the natural world and you're alienated really from intimate relationships in part because your biology doesn't work that well to uh, allow for intimacy. And you can be called then uh, a society of hungry ghosts, always looking for something to feed the, the holes you have in your heart, the primal wounds that have not been healed. And what occurs then is because people are dysregulated at multiple levels, they, they don't tune into relational agreeableness, then a lot of laws have to be set up and a lot of uh, sanctions because they're hard to control. And overall, there's a loss of heart. Instead of heart-mindedness being developed, the opposite has occurred. And so our, we're not really our fully human selves. What's happened then is uh, we've um, moved into a suboptimal pathway. The wellness-informed pathway has been forgotten. And we're in this trauma-inducing pathway where every undercare aspect is a risk factor. It's suboptimal and it's a risk factor for developing a self-focused personality. When your stress response kicks in, when it's activated, your blood flow shifts to mobilize you for flight, fight, freeze, faint, uh, or flight and fright first anyway, flight, fight. And 
uh, you are unable to think very compassionately or think very openly or think very well at all. And so it's just the way the biology works is going to make you more self-absorbed. And you do not then maintain the pathway, the wellness informed pathway that leads you to an other inclusive personality in our ancestral context and in our heritage. So in, in effect, what is ethical is to provide what babies need, what young children need, connection, uh, responsiveness, and all the components of the nest. Whereas it's really unethical to deny what babies need, that this is really forms of adverse childhood experiences, baby aces, uh, which then are is shaping a subhuman almost, suboptimal human, uh, which we wouldn't do to animals, but we do to babies routinely and create societies full of underdeveloped human beings. And it's unethical because it's harmful to the infant, both in the immediate moment, as we've talked about, but also long term. And so this is a very important why it's ethical versus unethical, you know, how important it is, because in meeting the needs of the infant, you're really building that human person, which contributes to a larger society. That's right. And so we can ask, do we need a baby bill of rights? The Convention on the Rights of the Child of the United Nations actually doesn't focus on babies, it focuses on children. And I think, and others have thought too, that babies need to have their own Bill of Rights. And this must be accompanied by a mother Bill of Rights because mothers are central to the well being of babies and they also need the support, the layers of support from society that we used to provide in our ancestral context. So, this is a list of possible. Uh, baby bills of uh, rights. Um, and I'm not going to read it through, but you can look at it uh, and discuss it. So what's happened is we've underdeveloped our fullest capacities. Uh, and what it looks like, actually, is a left brain dominance instead of an integrated brain. In the early years, the right hemisphere is growing more rapidly and with supportive care. And when there isn't the supportive care, the right hemisphere doesn't grow appropriately. And that's related to various things we'll mention in a moment. So the left brain is the one that likes to think it's in charge. Ian McGillchrist's book has uh, noted that it's taken over the Western world, which is the linear thinking, the categorization of life, the separation of life, the disconnectedness, all that is very much left brain preferences and the right hemisphere is quite different. Remember what human thriving looks like. All of this is a, is a feature or are features of an integrated brain. What does an integrated brain do? Well, it's able to exhibit polysemy. This is the ability to take multiple perspectives in the moment, the ability to perceive entities from multiple changing perspectives, depending on your context and mood. There's no one identity for any one thing. There's a transpersonalism, the ability to merge with multiple others, human and non-human, to take the perspective of the tree or the wolf or whatever it is in your environment. And this is a, a habit of de-differentiation, finding oneness with others rather than difference and separation. And the right hemisphere is all about connection, about energy inter interlacing among all the entities you see and, and feel. And the fullness of now is really part of this as well. This dynamic flow state is focused on the present moment, but in connection with the others that are not human, that are ancestors, that are other spiritual aspects of a dynamic fluctuating universe. So the individual is able to be in the moment and let the flow come through uh, the individual's heart. Generally, this is the emphasis of wisdom traditions. And when that flow comes through, you're not really hanging on to anything. You don't have a particular ego sense. You're just in the moment and you're dynamically flowing with that moment. 
and relating to others and enhancing their life. What's happened with civilization over the last 5,000 years or so is that univocity has become the primary way of being. It's a problem solving thinking. This is left hemisphere dominant and we see it in our Western world. Linear logical thinking is preferred, uh, assessing the past, predicting the future, relying on differentiation, having uh, set boundaries for things, something is or isn't something. Reality is one thing, not pluralistic, it's hierarchical, and there's an obsession with order, precision, prediction. Societies are hierarchically arranged, made up of separate little bits, and you can see this through all the offices, assembly lines, power structures, and contests determine who the few are at the top of the pyramid. And as a result, differentiation, which is emphasized, leads to deep anxiety and a terror of death, which is not seen in our ancestral context. The sense of the present is thin because the emphasis is on worrying about the future. And just a general disconnection from the holistic orientation of polysemy. The, uh, and the focus on the future is going to bring about certain death, which in this kind of society is only the thing that you're obsessed with. Whereas in our ancestral context, yes, people come and go, but they come back as another form. Uh, there isn't the fear of death in the same way. The right hemisphere development is dominant in early years, as I mentioned, and it's very important for self-regulation, for the vagus nerve functioning, which is a 10th cranial nerve that is connected to all the major systems of the body. And when it's not well functioning, uh, you can have various problems like uh, brain seizures or irritable bowels or uh, asthma and other um, breathing problems, heart problems, and problems with intimacy. And the right hemisphere enables us to feel social pleasure and intersubjectivity. It's a seat of our emotional intelligence, our empathy, our sense of being, and our ability to transcend our bodies and our individuality to join with a sense of, of higher um, connection and higher consciousness. Yes, and so the nets, as we've talked about, really promotes the right hemisphere development, which is taking place more rapidly in the first years of life. And so when you provide the nest, you're supporting the development of that child, but specifically you're developing, they're supporting the development of the right hemisphere. And as the previous slides showed that, you know, with the right hemisphere underdeveloped, you can lead to multiple uh, pathologies or limitations, right? Even within your thinking and within the culture around you. And so it's important to develop both parts of your brain, obviously. And so we can do that through provision of the nest. And the right hemisphere can be developed throughout life. Play is the best thing, playing with young children. Whatever keeps you in the present moment socially connected is going to grow your capacities, some of these capacities listed here. So get out there and play if you feel like your right hemisphere is underdeveloped. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's really important to understand is that the worldview is different in part emerging, bubbling up from our neurobiological development from our early experience. And here are two, uh, the two types of worldviews that Robert Redfield identified. He said there are just two. The one on the right is our, our heritage, and the one on the left is the one that has dominated us uh, from the 17th century on and has been pushed all over the world. So the one on the left is the view that the cosmos is fragmented, disenchanted, amoral, that only humans have spirit, only humans really matter. Humans are the pinnacle of evolution or of creation, depending on what you follow. And the characteristics of these people then are their restlessness, that's normal, to feel homeless on the earth, that the earth isn't home, uh, and the orientation to conforming landscapes to some abstract ideals that you have, like having a grass, uh, monocultural grassy lawn, for example. 
uh, and then hoarding because you feel so unsafe and disconnected, things make you feel temporarily better. On the right then is our indigenous heritage, our baseline. And that is characterized by a sense that the cosmos is unified, sacred and moral, that spirit pervades all things, that we are mutually related to everything, that humans actually are the younger siblings, that all these other creatures and entities have been around much longer than we have. We've only been around maybe six million years, depending on how you count it. And others have been around millions of years, billions of years, perhaps. And um, with this worldview, you feel placeful at home on the earth because you've been raised to attend to your relationships with everything. You fit in with the local landscape, with the bio community, you enhance them you do not destroy them, and you share reciprocally with them, with one another. And so these uh, indigenous characteristics are very much need the right hemispheres, uh, development, proper development, and the integration of both hemispheres. There are two wisdom traditions that I discuss in my 2014 book, neurobiology and the development of human morality, they have the primal wisdom is reflective of the indigenous wisdom that I was just talking about the indigenous worldview. Traditional wisdom here is referring to the Western world's uh, Christian traditional wisdom. They both share many properties. They both understand wisdom to exist beyond intellect, beyond that thinking mind, that conscious linear mind, conscious uh, self mind that we all uh, understand from being schooled in it for years and years. Wisdom accesses other realms. Humans have special responsibilities of co-creation of the world. Practice involves surrender to the energy realm. So that's allowing, as I was saying earlier, the energies of the universe to come in and flow in and guide you and it involves ego detachment to not be caught up in me and mine and my identity. Wisdom is state dependent. It is a sense of feeling oneness in love with all. And so fear must be overcome. Fear is something that uh, there are different practices that are used for that. And then there's some differences between the two types of wisdom for compassion the primal wisdom or indigenous wisdom is towards all of the natural world, whereas the Western traditional wisdom is towards people primarily, except for St. Francis, perhaps. <clears throat> the focus is on all forms of life in the indigenous primal wisdom. And in traditional wisdom, it's just on humanity. And what's interesting is <clears throat> what is feared for the primal wisdom, indigenous wisdom, is alienation from your animal nature. You are in animals with all these other animals. Whereas in traditional wisdom, that's what you're scared of, your animal nature. Ah, I don't want to be an animal. Look at how vicious they are. Well, I think this comes from all the undercare of babies that's occurred over the last uh, millennia. And babies who are undercared for are not going to look very nice, right? Because they're going to be upset a lot. And then you're going to create the kind of vicious uh, personalities that we mentioned. And they um, look very scary. So it's a lack of understanding, a lack of wellness informed understanding of what, how a human is created. And we want to emphasize again that the stories we hear and the stories we tell matter because they are shaping our understanding of who we are and who we can become. David Corton has pointed out <clears throat> that right now, the dominant story is one of sacred money and markets, and we need to return to the sacred life and living earth story. So let's just uh, talk a little bit more. Uh, we're almost finished. <clears throat> Excuse me. With the two kinds of practices we're talking about. Trauma-informed practice is now becoming an important feature of prevention intervention, uh, schooling, medical practice, at least in the United States, that people should be trauma-informed. 
so that they understand that people are coming to the classroom, to the doctor's office with possible trauma. And so that practice and responsiveness to their needs should be aware of that. We're talking about wellness informed practice, which is about optimizing normal development and reaching our fullest potential. <clears throat> yeah, and you know, circling back to the very beginning when we were talking about positive and negative peace, we understand that having one doesn't mean you don't have the other or having positive peace doesn't mean you don't have uh, negation of the negative. And so we're talking about putting it all together here in this slide is that it's important to understand trauma-informed practices, but this is not enough. That doesn't mean that that is not supporting the wellness uh, that is needed to support development. So these go together and uh, they're related, but they're also independent. So again, our wellness promoting heritage is the cycle of cooperative companionship. All of these, uh, this cycle, all four of these are performed or are within the context of a thriving earth. And we wanna point out that we can intervene at each point. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, so if there are experiences in your childhood that you did not receive of the nest, there are components of unnestedness, it's possible as an adult to heal and repair as we talked about uh, different healing practices. So at any point in this cycle, there are options for change and for healing and growth. And children who are coming to schools, uh, there are practices teachers and educators can take to help them heal. And the adults themselves can go into therapy or find other ways to uh, heal their own uh, individually, their own selves, but also their relationships. And then the community can also work to be more focused on wellness promotion instead of only trauma-informed care mm -hmm. and make sure that the Evolve Nest is provided to all children. Mm -hmm. And it, Yeah, and it begins with understanding what our needs are, as we talked about and outlined those in the nest. And just having that understanding of what we need is part of the healing process then you can make choices to be able to satiate those needs, both as an adult and for uh, developing people. It's also helpful to understand what thriving looks like. Uh, and so that's why we showed you those characteristics and what kind of um, living on the earth looks like. Uh, we spent less time on that, but we wanted you to know uh, what the pieces are for wellness promoting lifestyle. There's more information at these locations. Uh, we thank you very much for your attention. There's lots on, uh, we have other podcasts and essays and blogs and various things at these locations. And make sure now we want to uh, tell you to check out evolvednest.org, which has lots of um, things for you to use, like the child care tools. checklist. And uh, which examines nesting conditions for children in childcare settings. There's things you can do if you're a new parent or a grandparent on baby care. Uh, so if you click on these images now, they should work in the uh, PDF we'll have. These are 28 days then of, of suggestions. And then there's 28 days of self-calming. If you've had some issues with that, if you get upset uh, or self-blaming or blaming others, these are things you can do for 28 days to get you going. And there's 28 days of nature connection. We call eco-attachment dance, if that's something that you need uh, to get back to. And then we do urge you again to watch the film that has much more to uh, provide you more uh, kind of sensibility about what we're talking about. And it's about six minutes. So. Yeah, it's six, six minutes, minutes long and it's going to start here because I, I mm -hmm. put the link there. So never mind. <laughs> but thank you. Uh, let's see if we can go to the next slide. Yes. And there's uh, discussion groups you can join. And there are 
our image permissions. So thank you very much for your attention. And we will show ourselves briefly. Hello. <laughs> and thank you for listening. <laughs>